now in my presentation. I am going to talk about one of the very new topic, relatively speaking, in psychology. Uh, in many parts of the world, we call it positive psychology. But I'm a clinical psychologist myself, so in my research and my clinical work, I apply positive psychology to help people with difficulty. And today, I'm going to share with you my experience in applying positive psychology and clinical psychology in having people in Hong Kong over the past 20 years or so. Now, let me show you a video first. From a movie. Okay, anyone know about the title of this movie? For some, yeah, okay, so you are? Shinrisley. Of course. <laughs> so young people may not know. Congratulations, you know, okay, even though you are very young. <laughs> so, there is something very special about this movie clip. Anyone notice that? Something special, very interesting about this movie. Many years ago, for she just this. And nowadays, if you go to Google to search, it's called the Red Girl or the Girl in Red. So there is a girl dressing in red in this particular movie clip. Now, I'm a clinical psychologist. So in the past, clinical psychologists and psychologists would like to focus on the background, the chaotic background. Psychologists don't have any interest to study about something positive in a very chaotic environment. So, no one notices. Psychologists, they don't, they, don't, they don't care about the red girl, they don't notice about the positive, they focus on studying the negative. Psychopathology. I got uh, the privilege to go to one of the beautiful, very beautiful beach uh, near my hotel in this particular city. So, I just noticed yesterday, I learned yesterday that people in Sri Lanka, you are very positive. I showed you a video clip, I think yesterday. Sri Lanka, probably you know about where it is. I was very happy yesterday in that particular area. So people are very positive. Now, for me, people from Hong Kong, I focus on the stormy water. It looks very dangerous to me. However, people in your country, Sri Lanka, so happy by some very simple things. Maybe a thousand people, more than a thousand people, just standing in front of the sea to enjoy the wave. This little girl, together with the father, they laugh. So, in this particular country, you're very positive. You're so positive that you don't need me to talk about positive psychology properly. However, I'm going to share with you some of the basic concepts in positive psychology. Now, this is uh, the three pillars of positive psychology three key elements of positive psychology according to Martin Salomon, the founder of positive psychology in America. So, according to him, many years ago when I met him in Philadelphia, he talked about three very important concepts. First, for positive psychology, we focus on strength as well as weakness. So that like clinical psychologists, like conventional psychologists, we help people to reduce their weaknesses as well as to enhance their strength. This is one thing. Second, we build best things. We build things that are good as well as repairing the bad. So from a clinical psychologist's point of view, we help people to reduce their symptoms as well as to build up their strength, something good in them. And for psychologists, according to the modern cinema, we concerned about making the life of normal people fulfilling as well as helping people with psychological problems. So we focus 
both are people with psychological problem and people with um, normal sort of uh, mentality. So these are the three key elements of positive psychology. They study and focus on positive emotion. Many people call that happiness. And they help people to build up their good character so that they have a good life. And finally, help to build up a positive institute, helping people to have a meaningful life. So people have a good emotion, positive emotions, they have a positive character, and using like their positive character to build up a good society. This is the latest model according to uh, people in America. So uh, they call it PERMA, PERMA including uh, five components. Positive emotion, we talk about that. Relationship, so positive psychology is also interested in helping people to have a good relationship, a meaningful relationship with the other people, which is very consistent with the Asian culture. And second, engaging people. Engage people into something meaningful. And helping people to have a meaningful life and achieving what they want to achieve. This is the PERMA model. Today I'm not going to focus more on the PERMA model because it can't be modified this model a little bit, then I'm going to talk about more later. So, what is applied positive psychology then? Now, what I'm talking about is the basic principle of positive psychology. In applied positive psychology, in some places we call it positive psychology intervention. So, positive psychology intervention are psychological intervention, helping people to cultivate a good emotion, a positive emotion, a meaningful life, positive behavior, and positive cognition, positive thinking style. And it is very important that positive psychology is not to replace traditional psychological approach. It's not going to replace conventional psychological intervention. It's a supplement of conventional psychological intervention. So in my research over the past 20 years, I focused both on psychopathology and positive psychology elements. A simple way to look at this is something like this. Now, traditional psychology, so traditional psychological intervention, we help people to avoid problem. We help people to cope with their problem. This is conventional clinical psychology. In the hospital, we do that. If you have a disease, you get depressed, I help you to reduce your depression. Positive psychology, on the other hand, help people to obtain something good and to savor, to enjoy something good. So they are complement to each other, both, okay? So today, I'm going to share with you some of my challenges and very fruitful experience in applying positive psychology to help people in Hong Kong. Now I'm going to talk about mainly two topics, assessment. In assessment, I'm going to introduce to you some of the assessment tools we developed over the years. And by doing so, I hope I will be able to also share with you some of the very key concepts in positive psychology. And towards the end of my presentation, I'm going to talk briefly about intervention. Now, I don't have time to talk a lot about intervention, but on the other hand, on Sunday, I got a workshop, and in the workshop, I'm going to focus more on intervention. So my key question is for you to think about before I start is first is a positive psychology construct cultural universal or cultural specific. So the basic question is when we learn positive psychology concept from people in America in the West, do we or should we make modification to suit people in Asia or in Sri Lanka? This is one thing. Second, as a clinical psychologist, I always got this kind of questions. Now, if I have the knowledge to reduce symptoms, problem of people, so someone got depression in the hospital because they got cancer, so I have them to reduce the depression. Is that enough? Is there any added advantage of building something good? It help people to reduce the symptoms. So, from a cost-effective point of view, that should be very good. Now, 
the administrator will ask us, why I need to give you resources to do more. And the added advantage are according to scientific research. So this is actually my topic. So most people will think that this is uh, negative, I hope. If not, go to see Dr. Okay. So something I'm not going to hear. And this, some people may think that this is positive and this is negative. In Chinese, in China, some people feel all this evil to talk about a lot about money, okay? So, depending. So, my question is now, these many people, many people in different countries will think that this is negative. How about those positive things? And for this one, people got some sexual sex, sex, negative. I have them to sort of get rid of those negatives. Should I also build up something positive? So, this is what I'm going to talk about today. Now, about the first questions, whether positive psychology constructs are universal or not. Um, I did a study a few years ago about Chinese and English words. Now, in America, they got a norm. They got some data. They call it, they call it a new database. So they have many, many uh, English words, and they have a system to ask people to Rate the variance of the words. How positive, how neutral, and how negative they are, okay, for those words. And they have a database. So they have some words that are positive, some words that are negative, and some words that are neutral in English. Now I wonder if you translate those adjectives, those words into Chinese, would Chinese people still rate those words as positive or negative consistently with the American norm? So you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, so there are three systems, okay, English word, Chinese word. And this is how usually people rate uh, the variance of the word. We call it SAM, okay. So um, SAM assessment mannequin according to a nine-point letters scale. So I don't focus on the details of this study. Basically, we translate some of the English word into Chinese. We ask a lot of people to rate the words. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus only on 174 words in the, a new system. A new system is a widely accepted system in the West. So, basically, according to this, if we do a scatter port report, the words, the rating of the words, one axis is the Chinese rating, and the other axis is the a new rating we can see the consistency of the rating, the concordancy of the rating. So, for words here, they, are, they have a low rating. So both Chinese people and Western people, the American, basically a European as well, would rate them as negative. For words here, they have rating in both languages. So both Chinese people and American people rate that as Positive. So the key finding is this. There are some words that are rate very positive in the Western world, like happiness. Chinese people rate this as neutral. I don't know if what you would rate in Sri Lanka. Okay. So when you talk about happiness. Some people say that ah, oh, in, in the West, in America, they say ah, oh, it's very positive. On the other hand, if you promote happiness in Chinese society, some Chinese people will think that it's not that positive. There are some words that are both um, positive in both languages, like delighted, freedom, enthusiastic. On the other hand, there are some very few words that are rated as positive in America and negative in amongst the Chinese decorator. Now, I'm not going into details about how we explain that. If you want to know about how we are going to explain it, or finally you go to the full paper. These are the five most negative words in Chinese and in the new system. So, Chinese people, when people Told them that you are stupid, you are an idiot, 
they become very unhappy. On the other hand, people in the West, they focus more on, um, uh, oh sorry, they focus more on the cancer, suffering, okay, pain. These are the five most positive words. Three down, delighted, enthusiastic. So, positive words um, in Chinese, um, these are the positive and these are the negative. Uh, uh, these are the positive uh, words in um, English. Now, the most important finding is that the concordance rate, right? so the consistency between negative words are higher than positive words. So that when you talk about something negative, is more universal compared to something positive. So we need to be very careful when we apply positive psychology concept into Asia. I give you another example. This is one of my very early work in positive psychology. I study happiness. In positive psychology, we call it subjective well-being. So. I argued many years ago when I go to America for the American Psychological Association and Convention. I uh, argued with, with them that the American concept of happiness cannot represent the total picture of happiness amongst people in China, amongst the Chinese. So in America, they focus on an individualistic concept. I am happy. So if I am happy, this is the total picture of happiness. On the other hand, in, um, in Asia, we argue that there is actually another dimension called collective independence, interpersonal happiness. So in China, I go to the hospital, I look at my patient, I ask them, I told them that, okay, I'm coming here to help you. Some of my patients got a lot of assistance in receiving psychological help in the hospital, even though they got serious psychological problems, like depression and serious physical disease, like cancer. On the other hand, if I tell my patients that I am coming here so that I will be able to learn about your problem and because of that, I will be able to help your significant others. So I come here not to help you, I come here to learn about your problem so that I will be able to help your wife, your children to be able to cope better with your disease. Then they become more receptive about psychological help. So Chinese people, Asian people, perhaps in collective culture, we care about the well-being of my significant others and we incorporate that into our own subjective well-being. This is what I'm arguing. And in Korea, someone said that there is also a social norm. So in Korea, in Asia, if you don't have a job, you cannot be happy. You cannot tell people that I'm happy. Even though you're really very happy, you don't have a job, you can spend a lot of time with your family. You don't tell people that because of the social norm. In China, it's like, if you don't have enough money, you should be unhappy. And you don't tell people that you're happy. So according to one of the researchers in Korea, he called this social norm, the social dimension of happiness. So there are different dimensions of happiness. And in my research, I add, this is actually the very common questionnaire uh, to national happiness. Uh, five item subjective well being scale developed by acting now. And on top of that, I developed another international item. So, don't worry about the international item. I talk about more about this in the workshop. And the major thing is that in my study, in exploratory factor analysis and confirmatory factor analysis, in both Hong Kong and in China in Beijing, we found that there are actually two dimensions of subjective well-being. So if you want to measure happiness for people in Asia on top of the individual happiness, probably you want also to take care of the interpersonal dimension of happiness in assessment. So this is one of the early conclusions we have. Human beings are capable of deriving true happiness from the happiness of significant others. And this dimension of happiness should be relevant to the overall subjective well being. I mentioned this around 2002 in America. At that time, there are some resistance, but over the years, many people in, in the West, in Europe, in America, they study and they also confirm that there is also another dimension, the interpersonal dimension of happiness amongst people in the West as well. Relatively speaking, so probably interpersonal happiness will be more important in Asian culture and collective culture. And to a certain extent, individual happiness will be more important in individualistic culture in the West. Now, we talk about the, our current research. 
assessment of strength and virtues. Now, in positive psychology, virtue and strength are observable traits. Man is that manifest in cross situational, across situation okay, that are beneficial to both self and the other. So this is positive psychology. In positive psychology, you want to build up strength, character strength of people that are benefit to both self and the other. This is the basic definition of virtues. And in positive psychology, Martin Seligman and his team member propose this structure of virtual and strength. So basically, there are 24 character strengths. According to Chris Patterson, these 24 character strengths are cross culturally valid. So in all cultures, in all countries, people value these 24 character strengths. And they cluster the 24 character strengths into six versions. Okay? So there are some concepts. So this is the questionnaire, 240 item to assess 24 strength. And there are some soft form, 120 item. Okay. Now my problem is that over the years we gave people this 240 character strength scale to complete. It's too long, too complicated. Imagine you got depression. I ask you to complete the questionnaire, 240 item, you better kill yourself. Okay. You can't stop, yeah. Right. Anyway, so 120 is still too long. Now, this is one problem. We did a shorter questionnaire. And another problem is that we found both amongst my colleagues in Manager and myself in Hong Kong that some of the items are not very valid in different cultures. I'll give you some example. I never tell outsiders bad things about my team. In China, this is expected. You don't tell people bad things about your team. This is not an item about citizenship, according to us. Okay. Spiritual items. I practice my religion. In mainland China, um, it's not very appropriate to talk about your religion in mainland China. So it's, yeah. Uh, and then we don't, we don't expect people to talk about um, religion. Now, this one, courage. When I hear people say something to me, I make a protest. Imagine a professor in the university. He told you something wrong, you raise your hand and tell him, I don't agree with you, you are committing suicide. So sorry. You will get a fail, okay? You will you get a yeah, fail uh, in your examination. So in China, it's not very appropriate. It's not actually an item to measure courage. It's expected. I don't know about Syria. However, self-regulation. I have no trouble eating healthy food. I have trouble eating healthy food myself, so I don't have, I don't story have this item. On the other hand, in some culture, if you don't even have enough food to eat, how do you care about healthy food? No matter what you have to eat, it's something that just in China. So some of the items are not totally applicable to people in different culture, in China at least. And we talk about, about this in one of our paper. So, and, and on the other hand, many independent studies in America, they found that the virtual structures is not valid, cannot be repeated, even in some population in America. So, I talk about the six virtues, 24 character strength. These factors, we got factor structures. So, when you administer the question, yeah? The scoring is not totally correct, even for people in America. In America, more studies are saying that they are actually the questionnaire itself can be clustered into three factors. We replicate that in Hong Kong. We find the same three factors. I skip the um, details of the study. So consistent with literature study in America. We found there are three important versions in China. Interpersonal strength. So if you have an interpersonal strength, you are doing good to yourself and to the society. Now this is the basic definition of virtues. So if you have a good relationship with other people, you care about other people, you are doing good to yourself and to the society. If you are intellectual strength, intellectual strength, strength meaning curiosity, creativity, mentality, you are very eager to learn about new things. 
then you are doing good to yourself and to your country, to, to your society as well. And on the other hand, there is another strength called temperance, consistency. So, greed. So you are very consistent. You don't mind repeating doing the same thing over and over again. But once you start, you will determine to finish it. But particularly very for people for people in China. So you are, if you are like that, you are doing good to yourself. So we are arguing that together with some independent researchers in America, that these are the three important virtues, probably applicable all over the world. Of course, I'm very eager to do some study in Sri Lanka, in this part of the world, to see if it is applicable also to people in this um, country. And I even do another study to develop a very brief strength scale, like 12 items only. So um, this is actually a um, paper in psychological assessment. So because in a hospital, I administer the questionnaire to my patient, I did a very short questionnaire, a brief questionnaire, a trial final, in order to assess the three virtues, the three strengths for clinical application. So I developed that, and this is actually the items of the brief strength scale, still measuring the same three character strength, the same virtues. And in my experience, it is more amenable. It is more. It is easier to handle. First, it is soft. Most people don't mind doing that. And also, the concept of free virtues in applied psychology, it is easier for easier for people to understand, for my patient and my student to understand. So that if you tell them that you have free strength, this is your score. It is easier to understand than twenty-four strength than a lot of them strength. So my conclusion is that in um, a cross-cultural kind of a situation, there is a three-factor structure applicable to people in Manchester, to Hong Kong, as well as to people in America. And the 12 item brief strength scale can complete a longer inventory. And it is especially useful for screening panels and to monitor the progress of our patient in intervention. And again, I'm very eager to repeat this kind of study in this uh, part of the world to see if the strength, the uh, brief strength scale be available to people in this country. And there are many studies uh, in our hospital, in public hospital in Hong Kong, any correctional services study in Hong Kong as well. Now, I'm too negative. I'm, I'm not very positive if I tell you that most concepts in positive psychology are not applicable to people in other cultures. I'm going to show you another study to illustrate that some concepts are actually applicable with little modification for people in different parts of the world. We developed a post traumatic growth scale together with uh, Richard Detesky in America. Now, I give you a little bit uh, ideas about the brief, the PDG, the post from the growth my concept. Now, after a disaster like landsliding, we call it an adverse event, a trauma. There are several possible outcomes in the past. Psychologists focus only, or mostly, on these two. So, after a traumatic event, people have a decrease in functioning and gradually they die. So they deteriorate, continue to deteriorate after a traumatic event. This is extremely important that we help those people to prevent them from um, deteriorating. And also, there are some people who can survive with impairment. So I have a traffic accident, but uh, people have a traffic accident and then they become uh, disabled. So they survive with impairment. Psychology as well. So after a traumatic event, people survive. They still be able to function. However, they are more prone to develop depressive symptoms. They have some difficulty in interacting with the other people. So this is survival with impairment. Now there is another two possible outcome. Less focused perhaps by clinical psychologists. One is called recovery. So there are certain group of people after a traumatic event, they have a decrease in functioning and then they bounce back to their original level of functioning. Now they we call that resilience. Okay. That is okay. However, there is another phenomenon. Less study 
by psychologists called post traumatic growth. Many years ago, a very famous psychologist uh, in America called this thriving, Charles Tower uh, called this uh, thriving. Now they call it, we call this post traumatic growth or benefit finding. So there are some people now. In the past, we focused on those people with problem, and we studied why, why uh, there are some people with problem after a traumatic event. On the other hand, now like, we want to know why some people be able to survive without impairment after a traumatic event. Let's start in flooding. Okay. We know very little about the characteristics of those people. This is the focus of process security. So, I mentioned some years ago in Hong Kong that a positive um, psychology, the positive psychology. Positive psychological change uh, in individual experience a maintenance of functioning after a traumatic event, and this can be a transformation, a qualitative change, in addition to a quantitative change, a change in nature, personality characteristic of someone. I give you an example. A quick example. I hope, yeah. Now this is a Robert Fascio. And oh sorry. Uh, I met Robert many years many years ago in Philadelphia after September 11. At that time, Robert was very depressed. He told me that his father was killed in the incident. The story was that his father held the door for the other people to escape. So, so in September, September 11, his father held the door so that other people can escape. And in the end, his father would not be able to make it. His father died, killed after the incident. So Robert was very depressed at the time when I saw him in Philadelphia. On the other hand, he told me that he will try to use his experience to help the other people with similar problems. Okay. Let me hear about the story of Robert. Hello, I'm Rob Fazio with Hope and North Fathers. I live in the U.S. in a city called Philadelphia. And I'm uh, honored today to be talking with you about growth through adversity and using adversity as a way that you can actually achieve excellence in your life. Uh, most people, when they think about adversity, they think about things that happen to them as opposed to things that they may happen. Uh, and I wanted to share my story with you, hoping that it'll connect with you in some way and help you fulfill some of your dreams. On September 11th, 2001, my dad was in the South Tower, and he was one of the first people to see the planes in Tower 1. And he inspired and led many of his colleagues uh, out of Tower 2, and they were saying that you should stay in the towers. Um, he led them out of that. We kept getting phone calls from people asking where my dad was. Uh, we kept saying, we're not sure. Um, and the thing that they kept saying was, he was holding the door. He's got to be around. He was holding the door. He was helping us. Um, and we didn't find my dad that day. We unfortunately lost him. What we did find was a way to help other people help themselves. And that way is through opening doorways for people. Uh, when September 11th happened, it was obviously a very traumatic and adverse event. Uh, what happened after that was where all the positive came from. Uh, the idea of helping others uh, has really been a way that people have caught on to and connected to. Uh, so we decided to use that metaphor as a way to inspire people to help themselves. So this is Robert Moore, well, that's our day. If you Google, Hold the door, you will find the website of Robert. So he is trying to use his experience to help people with similar loss, with similar experience. So in psychology, can we study those people, derive, find some characteristic of those people with positive changes, and be able to cultivate positive changes amongst those people after a traumatic event so that they will be able to make good to themselves and to the society as well? So this is one of the mission of positive psychology today. And we did some experiment, we, we did some study after science as well, together with George Barano of Columbia University in New York. Similar findings. And in fact, in Chinese, 
the concept of post-traumatic growth is very consistent with the Chinese culture. These are two Chinese characters. This is Wai Ji. So this is danger, this is opportunity. In amongst the Chinese, if you have danger, if you have trauma, there is a possibility for you to have positive changes. There is an opportunity there. Okay. This is adversity in Chinese. So someone rolling the boat okay, against the current. So the moral is that if you are under adversity, if you work hard enough, you will still be able to gain something out of it. So this is a Chinese culture. So some parts of imposters are going to be very consistent uh, with uh, the Asian culture, that is the Chinese culture. And we complete a study about the post-traumatic growth scales. I'm not going into details about this particular scale. You probably, if you go to the Western corner, you will complete the scale yourself. Okay. So the major thing is that we find very similar structure, factor structure. So according to America, which is the task scale, there are actually four dimensions of potential positive change. Self, spiritual, interpersonal, and life orientation. We find similar structure in our study amongst people in Hong Kong. So the essence is that there are some concepts in positive psychology, like post traumatic growth, that are very consistent with Asian culture. And in terms of assessment, some of the instruments that develop will be able to applicable uh, to people in, in Asia as well, at least in, to people in China. So, we did other study to control for trauma, to control for culture. We did another study in Taiwan as well. So basically, they are similar, the factor structure. So the question here is applicable to people in mainland China. Now, I talk about one potential application of this concept of post-traumatic growth. In cognitive behavior therapy, we talk about cold condition and hot condition. Cold condition will be the fact. So, if you don't have cancer, you believe that you have cancer. This is an incorrect co-cognition. In psychotherapy, we help them correct this wrong condition, inappropriate condition. Okay. However, there is another way. So we correct the you have cancer, it's a non distorted condition, is the fact the fact is correct. We help you to have a distorted condition, positive condition. It's a little bit um, difficult to grasp. I'll give you an example in Hong Kong. This is one of the posters by the uh, Hong Kong Cancer Fund. So they are telling people that if you have cancer, cancer is a potential opportunity for you to gain hope and glory. Okay, so this is it. You have, I have cancer, and in psychotherapy, a psychologist and help. If it is wrong, you don't have cancer. You have a problem. You have a delusion that you have cancer. I have to understand that you don't have cancer in psychotherapy. Or if you have cancer, you think that um, it's an awful experience to have cancer. I help you to correct those um, awful experience. And then finally, it's awful to have cancer. I do it further. I do one step further to help you understand that having cancer can be an opportunity to grow. This one is positive psychology. Now, Traditionally, we do this only. It's, an, it's awful to have cancer. I have to understand that it's not actually very awful to have cancer. You'll be able to cope with it. This is positive psychology. If you have cancer, I got some study telling you that it is a potential for you to grow. So my reflection is that there are some cultural elements in positive psychology, more cultural elements in positive psychology. You need to exercise care and do more research in order to understand about it the ability of positive psychology concept in our culture. Now finally, before I close, I use the five minutes and five minutes or so to talk about intervention. Again, uh, I will talk more about intervention in my workshop. This is the model we are using, we call it the shine model. So in our intervention model to help people to increase their resilience, we cultivate strength, we cultivate hopeful thinking style. We help them to interact with the other people. We help them to notice both the positive and the negative. And we help them to embrace changes. And this is a last book chapter about empowerment of teachers. So in Hong Kong, the teachers are facing a lot of stress. So we are having uh, those teachers and the students as well uh, to increase the resilience. Uh, this is actually a model we are using in hospital psychology in Hong Kong. So, 
First, I will focus in this presentation on three key topics briefly. First, we help people to notice both the positive and the negative. So we are very sure that if you focus only on the negative, after a major, charm, major, major disaster, you got more depression, you got more anxiety. On the other hand, if you can see both the positive and negative, you'll be able to cope better after a disaster. So in Hong Kong, and in, other, in, in many channels, after Sichuan, after, after different disasters in China, we help people to notice both the positive and the negative. We skip this. Gradually change this. So, in Hong Kong, we help people to notice both the positive and the negative by doing a very common exercise in positive psychology. But before we do that, we do study. We investigate people. Now, this is a very common experiment in psychology. We study about attentional bias. We call visual dot prompt task. So, we don't talk in details about how we do it. If you Google, you will be able to know about these um, procedures. We administer the test to people with breast cancer in the hospital. Now, imagine that if you got cancer, the symptoms is life and death to you. So if you got if people got breast cancer, something wrong with the body, they need to pay extremely uh, uh, attention to those symptoms because it is out of their life. So gradually people forget about something positive in their environment. The same applies to medical doctor, oncologists, psychiatrists, and certainly clinical psychologists. Uh, we are trained to focus only on the negative in the past. So if you focus only on the negative, if you are a clinical psychologist working in the hospital for long in a period of time, you got family problem. You focus only on the problem of your kids. When your kids go back home, you say that oh you did something wrong because you are trained to focus only on the negative. So in positive psychology, we ask people to do this. You can do this even now. Think about three good things happening to you after you wake up today. Some people can do it very quickly. Some people have some difficulty in doing that. Now, if you train people to do that every day, imagine you got a, you got a child, every day he comes back home, or she comes back home, you ask him, what is wrong with you today? Gradually, you train him or her to focus on the negative. On the other hand, if your child comes back home today, you ask him, tell me something good today. Gradually, that child will focus, will have more sensitivity towards the positive. I'll give you an example. This is one of the facilities we create in Hong Kong. How is today? How is today? Maybe that is a clinical psychologist at the moment. So, uh, what shall we do now? Some exercise? I have worked with uh, women offenders for almost 10 years. I have a dream, size of our uh, emotion, children center for them. Her dream came true in March 2011. A psychological gym she helped conceive assists women to overcome the main risks of why they commit crimes and reoffend. We target those with uh, psychological problems, emotional problems, who so suffer from depression, adjustment disorder, or uh, with past trauma, history of uh, self harm. We done in a therapeutic environment. It's not easy being far from my family. Eva 41 is one of the 10 inmates to be admitted to the Sai Gym. She served seven of her eight year sentence for trafficking 1.4 kilograms of cocaine from Brazil to Hong Kong in November 2004. A battered wife, she divorced her husband in 1999. Because of jealousy, you heard me even pointed a gun to me. Filipina fell for a foreigner she met online and dated him for a year in 2003. Jobless and single parent, Eva asked him to help pay for a job placement fee so she could return to Taiwan and work again as a caretaker. She said if you can travel in a place, you just pick up some things. If I knew you would stress. I won't go. I still have anger and hatred in my heart to those people involved in my incarceration. 
women sometimes they commit crime due to um, their emotional uh, problems or because there are other risk factors like being a single parent, like a living with a criminal partner, men will commit a crime to show their power. But women, they commit a crime due to their powerlessness. It's a good development. Eva's mother died during her So this is the situation in Hong Kong. We call that other nationality. Other nationality, the nationality that Chinese. Okay. So there are some people from Africa, South Africa, from the ship, from other part of the world. They take a small amount of illegal drugs in Hong Kong to earn enough money just to feed their baby at home. And then they get that drug into prison for more than 10 years because of that. They are very depressed. So this is a new award winning facility inside the prison to help them to cope with their depression, emotional problem. You can say positive psychology. We just got a lot of people impressed about um, this facility in the International Journal of Offender Therapy. So this is very successful and um, Hong Kong government give a lot of award to this facility and it is new pioneering in the world as well. And we are trying to establish similar facilities in public hospital nowadays. So that if you got cancer, if you got long term illnesses, life threatening illnesses, could we do something like doing counting blessing to increase your sensitivity towards towards something positive? I worked in the pediatric cancer work myself for years. Some children with cancer, they told me something positive. They told me that okay, this uh, medical doctor, they wear a beautiful it's the cartoon ties today. So he, he, this particular nurse, he dressed in red today, so very cheer, cheering, uh, very wonderful. Some of the children, they don't notice that as well. So in Hong Kong, we encourage the oncologists to paint the wall in different colors, so that we will sensitize people to notice about the positive inside the hospital to cope with the depression. So we are doing something like this. This is positive psychological interventions, okay? So, and there are other things we are doing. We have some storybook to teach people about hope. But we have some sort of a manualized intervention to increase hopeful thinking style of uh, people. Uh, all manualized, all with research. We have a strength-based intervention for parents with children suffering from cerebral palsy. This is a very moving kind of a study I did, an intervention I did. We have a group of parents, all with children suffering from cerebral palsy and they sit together and we talk about the strength of themselves first. So in China, in, China, in, in Chinese culture, if you, are, if you are a baby with a problem, you have very low self-esteem, you think that you must be something wrong uh, with yourself to have a baby like that. So in the group, we have them to notice about their character strength. Then we help them to know about the character strength of their child. You won't imagine that they cry on the spot when another parent told you that, oh, your child is very caring. She helped my child to get on the we have bus, to get on the bus, okay, one day. So your child is a very caring baby. On the spot, immediately the mother cried. So we are doing something like this. All published. So in case you want to learn about um, all this I kind of uh, intervention, you go to my uh, workshop on Sunday, I will talk more about this and share with you how we are going to do this and then as well. So thank you very much.